we're going to start. I'm so grateful that Olenka is here to talk with us today. And she is going to share some tips and tricks about assessment, which is for those of us who are experienced teachers, it's always good to think about this. And for those of us who are new teachers, it's always good to learn about this. So it's a really helpful topic for everyone. I've got my paper here so I can take some notes. And on that note, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Olenka. So can you see my screen? Um, almost. Now we can, oh. yes. Oh, okay. good. Uh, so I'm afraid I cannot see anybody's face, so I'll just keep talking and I'll say if anyone looks confused to please, um, I can't say raise your hand because I honestly cannot see a thing, but let me begin. So this session is about the basics of assessment and of course certain basics uh, also require some common underlying or background understandings. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. So my goal for you is by the end of this workshop, you should be able to understand the language learning needs of heritage language learners in general. You should be able to briefly explain Bloom's taxonomy you should be able to name three types of assessment. You should be able to describe or add to the, assess the, the assessment strategies you already use. And you should understand the importance of setting goals, aligning goals, providing support for learning and student self-reflection as they all relate to the assessment in each class you teach and for each project for assignment. Okay. So I thought I'd begin with a brief review about what the research says about heritage language learners. So this is not the same as necessarily a second language learner. So the difference is a heritage language learner grows up with exposure to the language and some language ability. Maybe it's only listening, or maybe it's speaking and listening. A second language learner begins a class with almost no knowledge of the new language and is beginning to learn it. So the heritage language learner, a, a strong heritage language learner would be said to be bilingual, even though between, let's say, English and their heritage language, the heritage language would be weaker, especially the older the student gets and the longer they're in public school. They hear the language, they have a positive attitude that comes from the family, and they usually have a strong positive identity toward the language. Their strengths. Well, they can use the language in quite a variety of situations, um, especially if they have a chance to use it in their family, at social gatherings, perhaps shopping in uh, the community. They have what we would call good everyday. Some people like to call it kitchen vocabulary. So they're quite comfortable uh, talking about things around the house. Um, everyday life things, they tend to have a pretty good perception. And what that means is when they respond or interact, they recognize uh, people's hesitations, requests for more information, what some of those phrases like, hmm, mean, okay, so that they can participate in a community. Of course, alongside these strengths are some needs. And the main need uh, comes in, it's really one need, but it's very interrelated. Many heritage language learners have little to no exposure to literacy outside the classroom. And that means their reading skills are weak not necessarily their decoding skills. So by decoding, 
I mean, they know that when they see a certain symbol, it will sound like look, look, look. But when they look at the meaning of some of the words, especially if they are more formal or more academic, which is often the language they meet in readers, they become weaker. So their vocabulary has to build in a certain academic register in order for reading to become easier and writing to become more interesting. The other thing that is weaker is the aspect of grammar about what I could call compound or complex sentence patterns. So not just straightforward sentences, but a use of conjunctions like however, therefore, in light of, due to the fact that. All of these are academic style um, uh, vocabulary and terms. Why do they have these weaknesses? And why might they vary from child to child? Well, the first thing is that most of their learning of the language and use of the language is informal, at home, and sometimes what they're hearing is even a kind of dialect or a non-standard use of the language. Second, they have usually, especially if they were born in Canada, spent their early years here in Canada, not in a milieu where they would see the language in stores, on billboards, in a newspaper. So they've only had a kind of young child exposure to the language. Some people will say they speak childish heritage language. Um, they, of course, if they came to Canada when they were eight or nine or 10 and went to school in the heritage language in another country, they will have a more mature vocabulary and they will have seen the language, heard the language, and used the language in more varied situations. But if they're here in Canada, and even after they arrive, um, at, if they arrive at an older age, the amount of input they receive is very limited compared to native speakers. So if we think about our neighbors who might be only English speakers, they hear English all around them, all day long, everywhere they go, in their YouTube, in their social media, on in movies, everywhere they go, they're exposed to English. A rich variety of English uh, from all ages, formal, informal, whereas heritage language learners have a narrower um, uh, exposure to the language and that the language is usually oral, informal, and spontaneous. Uh, so you can see why, with those exposures that they've had, why certain areas are weaker. So, of course, these things that I've described can vary from learner to learner, depending on if they've traveled, some families um, like to have their children be able to go home every summer. And so then the, those learners will have much more exposure to a wide variety of places where the language is used. Some learners will see more film or um, videos in the language. Some, of course, um, might come from intermarriages where they don't hear or have as much exposure to the language. So these different factors could affect their your student's ability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a difference between a second language learner and a heritage language learner. Now, it's true you might have students in your class with very low levels, but usually they've got exposure to the language. So in summary, strengths, 
good ability to speak at home with family members, good, generally good grammar, conversational features that they learned before they started to go to school, and quite a bit of ability in oral language. Even heritage language uh, learners that do then go to the home country, um, even with a lower level of vocabulary, can function quite well because they've got enough oral skills to ask questions and interact. But they have needs. They need to learn um, more registers. They need to have more facility with certain kinds of grammar, the formal kinds of grammar structures that they will encounter when they read and this is and therefore write. So one of the things that I noticed in the discussions that we didn't really talk about are the four skills. So when we talk about balanced language, we're always talking about the balance of oral, meaning listening and speaking, and written, meaning reading and writing. And so the uh, what what the research suggests is that heritage language speakers will always be stronger at oral than at written. And I think anyone who works with ESL learners will also notice the same thing. Or if you've traveled and you've stayed in a, in a country for a while, you'll pick up lots of oral things, um, but not necessarily be able to read or write. Okay, the next thing I'd like to go through is Bloom's taxonomy. Um, for some of you, this might not be new at all, and for some of you, it might be a little new. So Bloom's taxonomy is a way of categorizing or classifying the kinds of things we ask students to do. And the terms at the bottom of the screen, remembering, for example, are what are considered easier or lower uh, level thinking. Uh, they require memory, but not necessarily deep understanding. So remembering, if you ever asked your students to make a list or find something or name something, identify, locate, describe, memorize, define, they are showing that they can remember. But remembering doesn't always mean they understand. And so part of assessing is not just what the students can do, but what the teacher asks the students to do. So if you ask other questions like summarize, explain, say something in your own words, they are showing higher level understanding. Of course, we should also be looking for them to apply what they've learned. Sometimes I will give my students a short one page um, set of information to read and ask them to make a chart out of that information. You could give them a short story that describes a person and then ask them to draw a picture of that person based on what was in the description. At the highest level, we will see students analyzing, evaluating, and creating new things. And of course, our goal is always to work at the higher level. But sometimes, as teachers, we can move to the higher level a little too quickly. Or we don't check in with students to find out why they can't function at the higher level. And it may be a lack of remembering or understanding some key concepts. So to help you along, and I'm happy to um, share this uh, PowerPoint, although it will also be in the video. These are words that can help you begin assignments for students or questions for students. And these words signal that you are asking students to remember or these words to understand. These words are asking them to apply. These words show that you're asking them to 
analyze or break down the information into parts and evaluate using these words uh, uh, that right here, and then create uh, using these words. So uh, summarize or synthesize is creating something new on your own. And um, some, I really like this uh, video or this uh, image because it shows the kinds of uh, the specific tasks you could ask students to do for each of these skills. So when you're asking them to define, you might be lecturing, you might be showing them visuals, showing them videos, having them listen to a podcast, uh, giving them examples, illustrations. And after this, you ask them questions that refer to remembering. Similarly, here are some tasks that relate to understanding. Uh, you could give a review, you could give a test, you could ask them to write a report, um, apply. Usually, maybe you ask them to do a little role play, a simulation, um, or to explain something to a peer. Analyzing might include, all. every level can include certain kinds of questions, but maybe you give them a problem to solve. Evaluate, you're giving them projects and create projects. And I'm gonna emphasize projects as we move along because those are so engaging for students if they're at the appropriate level. Judy, uh, we would like to show you something. Dilek, can you please show them what you showed us? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I found some charts, the Bloom taxonomy charts. So I'm I'm using uh, I have you know I'm using um, when I was in the university. So my, one of my our professors just uh, shared this chart with us. So and um, you know I explained that after. If you uh, if you are the you know teachers more than five years, so it is it started to be automatic teaching. So you sometimes you are forgetting about some strategies when you learned at university or something like that. After Olenka talk about the Bloom taxonomy, I, I remember that oh I have a you know chart in my you know uh, bookshelf, but uh, for a long time I didn't check it out. So how is how yeah. I am applying this once you know to my can you flip it to do like and show oh, them there are actually yeah, the questions the, that will help you. Yeah, it is some of the uh, you know level here and each level has definitions for example the introduction has the, the for example um is that on remembering sorry is that some definition here keywords and the some questions for the remembering and the next level each pages has including understanding for example definitions keywords and the questions you can ask your students to understand and for this is applying again definition keywords and the questions and uh, the analyzing and uh, evaluating and the last one is the creating great great so uh i know for some of you um this was just a light review for example dilik remembers using it for others it was a bit more of a review and even if you weren't that familiar familiar with it you did note that some of the things you do in your classrooms are at only certain levels. And so our goal is always to move from the easy questions so the students feel successful. If you're asking questions orally, you want everybody's hand to go up, right? Everybody knows the answer. And then eventually to harder questions, even if that is in a written test or just in classrooms. So, um, and I know when we share again, uh, you'll be able to share other ideas that you, uh, you, you've done. So I'm going to just continue with the, um, with my presentation. Okay. So, um, after we, now that we've done, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, I want to talk about three broad categories of assessment, assessment for learning, assessment of learning and assessment as learning. So when we think of assessment for learning, 
Another word you might have heard is formative assessment. And this takes place throughout the learning process. This is when you are watching students uh, complete a worksheet or working in a group and they're on task, but they might need some clarification. Or you're watching them to see, are they using a great variety of resources to meet the goals? Usually the assessment for learning begins with do they remember things and do they understand things and then do can they apply things and so assessment for learning done by the teacher is often done in the form of questions um, of course it can also go up to the higher levels of bloom's taxonomy so what questions are you asking and again, you can refer to the flip chart of Bloom, and that can help you begin questions with different kinds of words. Assessment of learning is summative. And the word summative comes from the word summary, and it's usually done at the end of a learning sequence. That learning sequence can be a unit, or it can be a semester, uh, or it could be at the end of a school year. And often, not only, but often it is done in terms of tests, midterms, and examinations. Um, what we hope is that it helps us as teachers see, oh my goodness, everybody got number 16 wrong. Uh-oh, something relates to me as a teacher or it relates to my test that I developed. Um, and it is not just what the student gets right, but the teacher to look at what the students didn't get right to help them continue with the planning and teaching. But more and more lately, we are using projects as a type of assessment of learning. Now, assessment as learning is where we involve students much more and they do self-assessment. So self-assessment isn't about what grade do you give yourself because it's not about everybody getting a 10 out of 10. It's about the student being able to monitor their own learning asking themselves, what did I do well? Oh, why did I do that well? Oh, what was not so strong? I, I practice this one quite a lot with my uh, grandsons. And um, I always say, well, what did you do well and why? Because I want them to realize that reviewing something doing a good job on in preparation for a test is part of what contributes to the good test result. Um, that doesn't mean they're still too young to cram, but uh, I wouldn't be always in favor of cramming for um, a test. So uh, the assessment as learning is developing metacognition, metacognitive awareness, and being able to take more responsibility for your own learning. Researchers argue that this leads to deeper understanding. Now, other words that are used uh, to describe these three types of learning. Uh, one is authentic assessment. So projects that relate to everyday life or take place in real situations could be considered authentic assessment. So authentic means it seems natural. And here's an example. Um, you have someone new coming to your school and they literally arrive and you ask a student to show them and take them on a tour of the school in the heritage language. Okay, now that's real because the stranger who has arrived doesn't know the school, doesn't know where anything is. 
And so if that was being recorded, for example, you would be able to see their success in using language in everyday situations. Um, you could also observe them if it was possible when they were doing shopping in the heritage language, going to a restaurant and ordering, or perhaps you're doing a kind of um, identity heritage project where they have to interview a grandparent or someone in a senior, a senior member of um, your community about a historic event and record that. And so they, uh, that recording could act as an authentic assessment. Um, another uh, term that you'll probably see quite often is what we call criterion reference tests. So this is not a test where you compare students and you give only one A and two A minuses and three B pluses and four Bs and four B minuses. This is where you give students criteria in advance. They have to create something to meet those criteria. And if they do and they do it well, everyone in the class could achieve full grades. Okay, so can everyone see my screen and is it at full screen for you? Yes, yes. perfect. Okay, good. So given the needs of heritage language learners that I described at the beginning, but given the needs that you described of your learners and the variety of levels of your learners, we need to ensure that we do both oral and written assessments. Remember, oral is for listening and speaking and written would be for reading and writing. So what I want to talk about now in terms of developing assignments that are um, assessments that could be authentic or could be projects. And the key word here is alignment. And um, I think you all know what alignment means. If you've uh, if you've uh, put um, a, a bunch of papers in a pile, you might be kind of um, going like this with them. I know you can't see me, but maybe you can hear me. So that they all align up. All the edges are together at the top and bottom and at the sides. So I want you to think about alignment. So the first and most important thing is that assessment, assessment begins with goals. And where possible, post the goals of a lesson on your board. And I like to suggest a can-do format. I can write a story. By the end of today's class, I can sing a song. I can. What is your goal? I can write about a friend. I can write my name in this script. I can write the name of my friend in this script. Be specific about those goals. Um, I want to make sure you understand the difference between an agenda, which is what will we do today, and goals, what we want to learn today. So by an agenda, okay, first of all, everyone, we're going to check our homework, then I'm going to read a story to you, then we're going to watch a video, then we're going to have a break, uh, our recess break, and then we're going to do this. That's what we're going to do. But what we want to learn today may be to be able to um, write about uh, a, a person in a story or write a, a summary about a video that we watch. That's different what we want to learn than what we will do. And I'm going to uh, make this link available to you so you can learn more about these ideas if you like. So we're going to go through an example. And this is an example of a project that I've often done. And I call it top 10 or top three. And um, Often in real life, we all uh, might read a magazine or a newspaper and we'll find 
you know, the top 10 books to read, the top 10 cars of the season, the top 10 singers, the top 10 movies. So we meet these top 10 all the time. Um, I do this activity with students where I divide them into groups and they each pick a topic. They um, develop a little survey and they ask everyone in the class uh, answers to their questions. And then they are able to classify or categorize the answers from the whole class or from the whole school, depending on how much time can be allotted. And then they write up and show me, oh, um, in this case, this was a survey that uh, was once done by students in downtown Edmonton. And they were asked about their favorite, number one only, fast food restaurant. And the number one was Subway. And the reasons were they thought it was healthy, fast. There were a lot of choices. It was cooked after the order, but still quickly. It was delicious and used fresh vegetables. The second choice was McDonald's for different reasons. The third was A&W for different reasons. The fourth was Edo. The fifth was Wendy's. And other responses are here. And then based on the number of responses, the students had to create a kind of graph that showed how popular uh, their different options were. So before I uh, give this task, I make sure students have been exposed to these kinds of charts. We go through them. We make sure it's clear. Today, I explained it to you. But if I was doing it with my students as a task, I would say, well, what was the number one restaurant? What was number two? And do you agree? And look at their reasons. What are some reasons you agree with? Okay, and of course, this would all be in the heritage language. Okay, just to give you another example, this was done about superheroes. Who were the top superheroes? And, um, you know, at the time that this was done, number one was Spider-Man. And here were all the reasons why. Number two was Batman. Here were the reasons why. Number three was Superman. And here are the reasons why. And then, again, there's a graph in the middle that shows, given all of the responses, um, how they all uh, shaped up. So now that students understand what the final project is going to look like, they should be ready to begin their project. So now it's my job to give them criteria. So I tell them that after they've done the interviews or surveys with their peers, they must make a poster. And the poster must include a title. And I might go back to these. Do you see a title? Yes. Okay. It must include a topic and go back. What was the topic here? American superheroes. And what was the topic here? Fast food restaurants. Number three, there have to be at least three results. So for some students, these, this group picked one, two, three. They met the criteria. This group did one, two, three, four, five. They also met the criteria. Um, then they have to give reasons for the choice. And so if we look back at the poster, you'll see here are the reasons and here are some other reasons. Here are the reasons and here are the reasons. So yes, they met the criteria. Similarly, here are the reasons. So we can say they also met the criteria. Uh, next thing is that there has to be a picture or an image for each choice. Uh, then they must use at least six different adjectives and I usually say they can't use good, nice, great, or those words that are commonly used. And so if we look back, 
we can actually count the words and we can see kind, strong, cool, handsome. Yes, they have overall used at least six different adjectives. There should be correct grammar and spelling to the best of their ability. It should include a graph um, or a pie chart. And in this case, I think both groups chose uh, a pie chart, but it could have been another form of a graph. And um, it should be colorful, neat, attractive, and it should be creative and have something special, okay? Something special. And um, that, what is, that, that thing that's special, each of them can decide. I certainly think that this one is very well drawn by hand. And I like the use of the web around the A. But I might ask the students, well, what did you think was special about your poster? Uh, this group would say, well, we put ours on the computer and they thought that's what made theirs special, whereas others drew theirs. Okay, now go to work and plan. And don't look at the bottom of this screen for a minute. Once they've finished their poster, I usually think of that poster as a draft. And then I show them the checklist. And so here are the questions that they now have to answer looking at their poster. Does your poster have a title? Does it include a topic? Does it include three results? Does it have give reasons for each result? Does it include at least six different adjectives? Did you check the grammar and, is, and the spelling? Is it correct? Is it colorful, neat, and attractive? And is there something special about it? And if they answer no to any of those questions, now they have a chance to revise and improve or correct their poster. Now, here is where alignment is important. Did you notice that everything here is stated here? And that's what we mean by alignment. The second thing is that it's not just the idea idea that is the same, but we use exactly the same words. So I don't say, does your poster have a title here? And say, does it have a heading here? Okay, to some people that might mean the same thing, but to learners, it what's a heading? And they don't know necessarily that that has the same meaning. So it's really important to use precisely the same words in your criteria as you're using in your checklist. And look at what this checklist is about before giving the poster to your teacher. You want all the students to achieve this goal. Okay, um, the next thing then is, um, to look at a presentation that they're going to do with their poster. So the first one was uh, the written task, and the second one, the presentation, is the oral task. And so here we uh, will again provide the criteria, and the presentation must include, really what this means is you must state, you must state, the title, the topic, the three results, the reasons, six adjectives, clear and loud voices we've added, okay? Because this is now the oral presentation. Everyone must speak, no reading. Can you interact with the audience? So can you say, what do you think was the top um, uh, superhero? And then, can you do something special, make people laugh or sing a song? And that is usually a motivator. And then uh, they begin planning. And as they're planning their presentation, they're getting close to being able to practice their presentation. They can record their presentation if they like. Everybody's got um, handheld devices these days. 
and then look back on it and say, oh, did we state the title? Did we state the topic? Did we take turns speaking and someone tell us the results? And so on. And notice that these are all in alignment. And then at the end, after the presentation, ask themselves, and this is now a reflection, did you enjoy doing and giving the presentation? What were the strong points? What could you do better next time? And what did you notice about the difference between English and the heritage language? In what ways are they the same or different? And so that's alignment. Um, now, uh, then I would take these same points and I would convert them into can-do statements. These are self-assessments indeed. But by can-do, I am asking the students to say, yes, I can do this. Mm, I can do it if I have help, maybe from my peers. Or, oops, sorry, I can't do that just yet. And this is a personal assessment. Um, most of the time when we put students in groups, there will be a strong student who would put yes to all of these. Then there'll be students who will be quite a few yeses and some with helps. And then others that are maybe mostly with help. Uh, but that helps you see where they think they are at. Um, and again, notice how this aligns. Later, um, I don't know if we're going to have time right now because I'm going to stop the sharing and ask you about alignment for a minute. And maybe given that we have a very short amount of time left in the session, we, instead of doing uh, small groups, we might just um, stay in our uh, large group. And my question is, do you use alignment? And have you ever had students say to you, I don't know, I don't get it. And then realize that you might be using two different terms that are clear to you, but might not be clear to students. And do you do all of the steps that I described? Criteria, um, a checklist before submission, um, and or when they're practicing and a, and a can-do statement that aligns. And I'd be happy to hear your ideas. You can unmute yourselves. I won't call upon you. Trudy can call upon you. Well, Trudy is going to start off by saying that while a lot of these things are ideal, because it takes so much work to be organized to do that, Olenka. Like you have to have, but it's a great opportunity as well, especially in a language class. If you think about this is the written work I want you to do. This is the oral work I want you to do. Make sure the oral work and the written work go together because sometimes we forget to do that and we forget to teach oral language as well. We want all the parents want the kids to come to the school to learn how to speak, but sometimes the teachers want to teach reading and we don't focus enough on teaching, on teaching oral language. That's my thoughts. Okay. Mimuna? Uh, Hello, yes. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm very new to heritage uh, language teaching, so... Um, <laughs> I understand that the projects they're going to uh, submit will be on their heritage language, right? But um, the instructions, are these instructions supposed to be in English or um, in, like, um, there are multi-level learners, maybe advanced learners will be able to read and write, um, like use the instructions in the heritage language, but for the others, um, we should be using English, right? Or is there any? I would say that um, you know what language is best. Um, and if 
if you feel that um, the assignment will best be understood, if you give it to them in English, I think there's nothing wrong with that. But you do want to um, maximize the use of the heritage language uh, when, when possible. Does so, that help? Uh, yes. So maybe um, for a beginner level student, I'll start with English and um, gradually switch to the heritage language when I feel yes, that they oh, will absolutely. be able to understand that, right? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else? I have one more quick slide. Well, is alignment new to you? Sorry. Is it something that you might not have thought about before? I think the word alignment is something new to us now because most of the activities have been really done separately without putting them all together as one. So I think yeah. the idea of saying we will have to align the, the poster or the criteria that you have done in order to be able to make it a, a whole, or maybe the word holistic. Is that the yeah. word that we can be I using? Think, yeah. Okay, and then, when we, and then when we talk about the alignment, many times it does not really happen um, in one day or in one week, but it becomes a project. Say, right. for instance, we call our school language and culture, and we always tend to put aside or set aside culture differently from the language. Because then we would say, all right, we're going to be using our indigenous instruments in order to be able to sing our folk music and so on. Not knowing that you can align that to the oral and the written aspect of the heritage language. So I think that's one lesson that I'm going to be talking about to my teachers and say, all right, we will not just be saying this is our string or orchestra. We have to completely align them with the language that we are teaching. Okay, good. So thank so you. I, yeah. So I think there's lots of people who've used checklists, lots of people who've used criteria, lots of people who've used can-do statements. But I've been in many places where they're not aligned. They're doing all three, but they haven't carefully looked to make sure that they're assessing at the end exactly what they wanted students to do. And, um, and so anyway, that was the reason I wanted to bring up alignment. But I also just want to give you one more little quick tool to think about for, and this might be more for advanced assessment, but I'm gonna do it anyway. It's only one slide, so please bear with me as I desperately try to get to it. There we go. Oh, come on. Oh, I guess I have to, there, sorry. Okay. So, um, I like this term being a cop uh, when you think about assessment. And um, I like it because it stands for three things that teachers should be collecting. For C, I think of that as conversations with students. And that's also can-do statements where you are looking for students to tell you how they perceive themselves. That's kind of what you could say is assessment as learning. Observations, what you see, what you observe as the students are working on projects. And that's a, quite a bit of formative or assessment for learning, but it can also be signs of students' confidence or lack thereof. And then the third thing to collect are products. Well, a test can be a product, uh, but work done in class can be a product, and so can be projects like the diorama that Matthew talked about. So as you move forward um, and 
as you gain more experience, I know Simon, you said you've only been teaching six months. So you need, as you gain more experience, you want to be thinking about involving students and listening to them tell you about their performance, how they think they're doing, their learning, observing. And do these line up? Um, I've met students who'll tell me they're doing terribly, and I think that they're doing fabulously. So we have to bring into alignment their self perception. And then are we collecting a variety of products? not just tests, but other things as well. So I'm going to stop sharing there. And um, thank you all for your attention. We did start late. So I am entitled to actually two more minutes. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, my final slide was simply going to be to ask you if we achieved the goals that I set out. Do you have an idea about uh, characteristics of heritage language learners. Uh, do you understand Bloom's taxonomy a little better than you did before? Can you explain um, assessment for learning, assessment of learning, and assessment as learning? And did you gain a few ideas about how to do that in ways that you wouldn't have done before? And do you understand and if there was more time, can you use alignment? So did you pass? Yes. Okay, then I'm happy. Olenka, all of your talk today just reinforces in me the thought that heritage language teaching is the most difficult kind of teaching. It's harder than teaching math. It's harder than teaching science. We have to work so hard, and especially in heritage language schools, we have to do all of this, and we only have three hours, and it yeah. requires 27 hours work to put together a well-thought-out three-hour lesson. Right. So thank you so much for giving us a lot of ideas on this. And Alenka, yes. thank you very much, because I took Blue's taxonomy with you 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's coming back to me and right. I'm saying, oh my gosh, how many, I, I have missed out on so many things. So now it's a matter of returning, going back and moving forward with all the good ideas that I learned. From you and you both still look 35. How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add that um, I certainly agree with you, Trudy. Uh, there's a lot of work in aligning. But I think the goal of workshops is to plant, is that teachers leave being able to say, pat yourself on the back. I'm doing this, this, and this. Yay. And saying, oh, there's one idea I'd like to try. One. And if you don't share a whole lot of ideas, then the choice is like going to a buffet and it's like there's no choices at this buffet, right? Or going uh, so to the buffet and eating a hamburger and french fries. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that everyone has one thing that kind of resonates with them. And they say, ah, that's something I'd really like to try. Okay. So this has been so much. helpful for me, Olenka. Thank you very yes, much. Very much so. Yes, thank you, Olenka. We just, I think uh, uh, all of us will pause and think about these steps because most of us, as Trudy uh, mentioned, we have only so much time in, in during the weekend and we rush things. But having this pause, and there are many, th many steps and they are happening at the same time. So now I will be more conscious about, okay, this is actually what Olenka was talking about. I can yes. just go back, give myself a little pat on the back. Yes. Yes. Just, even if I accomplish, let's say, three or four steps, that's, as you've mentioned, is already a big deal. And next time, maybe I'll be more successful and do three and a half. <laughs> but it's still well, Will we yeah. be able to get your, your um, lecture? Yeah, the reason that the I reason? wanted to stress alignment is once you've set your criteria, you take the same list and you make a checklist. 
And then you take the same list for your can do statements. So really, if you've thought that one list through, you get a lot of mileage out of it, Mm -hmm. but even a lot of support to students. Sometimes teachers say, oh, I can't do a checklist because I don't I don't have time. But if you set criteria, you do have time. Copy and paste and rephrase. Yeah. Okay. Good. Have a great evening. Happy spring.